dollar, dollar, dollar. Dirt and money, no soul. Had to go and get it, ain't no time to kick it. Gotta stack a flip for my foes. Dollar, 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 dollar. Please tell me you can hear me. Don't turn your back and don't neglect me. Just let me know if you need me. Dollar, 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 dollar. Let me watch out for my partners. Keep my money long, get my team strong. Let me run away from my problems. Yo. Let's get a bitch in the It's your boy DJ Duki, your girl. Sierra Nicole. We're back on the channel with another. Get and see original. Welcome, welcome back to the channel, man. We got to, where you thought I would go. No, I'm sorry, come back. <laughs> we got top three photos with disturbing backstories. Back this is part 22. Man, we just going all over the place. If y'all want more in order, let us know. We'll try to figure out, you know what I'm saying? Also, we always up for the recommendations because y'all finna start getting a long joint. Finna start getting a long joint. So go ahead, hit us up in the comments with your favorite mm -hmm. Mr. Ballin' story. We're going to try to write them down so we can be able to get to them one by one and go ahead and do the fan favorites so we can, you know what I'm saying, knock out the ones y'all really enjoy. Yeah. Then go, you know what I'm saying? We might dibble dabble every here and there, but you know what I'm saying? We just trying to <laughs> knock out what y'all really want to see. Right. So, with that being said, before we get into it, make sure you check out the links in the description box. Down below. You already know where to go if you want to further support. All you got to do is check out down below. Also, every single time we got to take the time out and salute to the coming of the day. Salute to you. We highly appreciate y'all, man. Keep running us up. Also, if you enjoyed today's video, leave a like on the video, man. We highly appreciate it. But, Top three photos with disturbing backstories. Mr. Baldwin, link to the original video is in the description box down below, man. Today, I'm going to share three progressively more disturbing stories. And at the end of each of them, I'm going to share the photo that is famously associated with them. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do. And we upload two or three times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please become a surgeon at the hospital located closest to where the like button lives. And then eventually when the like button goes in for very minor outpatient surgery, accidentally perform a craniectomy on them. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. Just after midnight on June 17th, 1939, a crowd of people began to form outside of this unremarkable building in Versailles, which is a city in France. The atmosphere in this crowd was electric. They all knew why they were there. They knew what they were about to see, but even still, there was a lot of nervous anticipation. And so as such, some people were coping with these nerves by drinking alcohol and trying to laugh and have a good time, while others were much more subdued and were trying to be respectful about what they were about to witness. Between 1 and 2 a.m., the doors of this unremarkable building opened up and a group of men dressed in the same dark uniforms came out and didn't say a word to the crowd, and the crowd immediately went silent and began to back away from them. And this group of men, they walked right out in front of this building, and they had lumber and they had tools with them, and they began constructing this kind of strange wooden structure. And so the crowd, they wanted to get up close to see what these guys were doing, but at the same time, they didn't want to get too close. And so as the crowd formed a sort of half moon around these men, these men that were doing the constructing were moving so seamlessly, like all of them had built this structure dozens of times before, and it was just muscle memory. And so by about 3 a.m., this structure was built, and they placed this large basket next to the structure, and then these men packed up their tools and the remaining pieces of lumber, and they turned around, and they went right back inside the doors into the building and were gone. At this point, the crowd had become quite sizable outside of this building, and they were growing kind of restless because they knew now that this structure was built, that the next time those doors open, the show is really going to start. This spectacle they are all there for, it's about to happen. And the crowd all knew that this event couldn't happen if the sun was up, because if the sun was up and the area was well lit, the press would be able to take pictures and film it, and that's not what officials wanted. They wanted this to happen in the darkness. 
but for whatever reason, things seemed to be getting delayed inside of this building. And so the crowd was just getting more and more restless. People are getting more and more drunk and they're getting louder and more disruptive and boisterous. And then around 4.45 a.m., the sun had come up. And so the press was out in full force with their cameras trained at the doors of this building. And so the crowd really at this point is not actually expecting this event to take place because at this point, it just seems totally unlikely. But at 4.50 a.m., those doors swung open and standing in the threshold was 31-year-old Eugene Weidman, who was a convicted serial killer. His arms were tied behind his back and the collar of his white shirt had been tucked down inside because they needed his neck to be free and clear because he was about to be beheaded. I cannot be out there for that. I cannot see that. I'm not the, the craziest... Bruh. You know, people used to actually get a thrill from seeing people get electrocuted, yeah. getting beheaded, getting hung. And I don't know if it was because they put so much like turmoil and 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 you know all the like this like tra trauma like on like the families like they you know hurt and stuff like that. I don't know if that was the reason why people was like okay seeing that, but that still was just like so weird to me. Like, I just... Just to watch a man die. Like, y'all come out thinking, like, a magic show or something. <laughs> like, the whole time I'm sitting there, I'm like, dude, about to have this big man. And something went wrong or no, something. I, I knew what it was. When, they, when he said it was a bucket they put beside it, I said, oh, that's for the... So the, the head can go in the Bruh. bucket. The two guards on either side of Eugene, they pulled him forward out towards the crowd so the executioners behind him, who were dressed all in black, could filter out and take up positions alongside the guillotine, which is that wooden structure that had been built earlier in the morning. And so as Eugene is being brought out towards the crowd and everything is getting set up for his execution, the crowd went wild. They were shrieking and howling and laughing and pointing and booing and just generally being completely rambunctious and totally bloodthirsty. Eugene kept his head down. He did not want to look at the crowd and he did not want to look at the guillotine. And so eventually the two guards turned him and walked him directly towards the base of the guillotine, at which point the executioners that had taken up their positions around this device, they grabbed him and slid him forward so he was on his stomach on top of this wooden platform, the guillotine. And they slid him forward until his head poked through this opening at the very far end, at which point his neck was positioned right under this huge blade that was dangling right above him, and his head was positioned over a metal bucket on the ground, which he would be looking directly at. At this point, the crowd was at a fever pitch, and one of the executioners pulled a lever, the blade came soaring down, and it removed his head, his head fell into the bin, and the executioners pushed his torso into the basket that had been placed out there earlier, and then the executioners and the prison guards, they gathered up Eugene's body parts and went right back inside of the building, which was a prison. At this point, the crowd was cheering and going wild, and they ran up and began dabbing their scarves and their handkerchiefs in Eugene's blood, which was on the ground as a sort of souvenir from having been at this execution. And of course, because the sun had been out for this entire spectacle, all of this had been captured on film. And so later that day and for the next couple of days, the headlines all over France were about this bloodthirsty crowd that was cheering as this man was beheaded. And it just overall made France look really, really bad. And so French leaders decided that from that point forward, they could no longer do any more public executions. So the guillotine would continue to get used for decades beyond this point, but it was all behind closed doors. Also, random fact about being beheaded by a guillotine, your head, after it's been separated from your body, stays conscious for about 10 to 12 seconds, so they say. And apparently there's been lots of cases where the executioner, after the condemned has had their head removed, will yell the name of the person who has just had their head removed, and that person's head will look over at the person calling to them and will blink or try to mouth words for several seconds before the lack of oxygen kills the brain and then the head is no longer conscious. Here are some of the more notable pictures that were used in the media from Eugene Weidman's execution. Could, I personally can be out there for nothing like that, bro. Like I don't like to be honest. Even when I don't, I don't care how vicious somebody is and, and the things they do. Even today's yeah time, 
I just personally, I don't believe in the depth. I don't care. Like I understand people are vicious and stuff, mm-hmm. but me personally, I'm just not a person who can be like, I want to see you dead because of what you did. Like, I don't believe man, like, even though they might have killed people, right, right, I just don't believe you just feel same like way. Just rot, yeah. You know? I don't believe like no man and, should hold any person, no matter what they have done life in your hands. Mm-hmm. Because even you voting on somebody to receive the death penalty, it's the same way you saying kill this person. And it's kind of like you are also responsible for well, somebody. I got a death. hand in it as well. That's one reason why even with jury duty, I honestly, I just said it personally, I don't believe every everybody should just have to automatically be summoned for jury duty because not everybody wants to be a part of judging someone. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. I don't believe like my my opinion, yeah. I don't you know what I'm saying? I don't want I don't want to have to be a part of somebody like they did something wrong, there should be a, a different process to convict someone. Everybody shouldn't you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It should be like certain I just think a lot of stuff should change because I do feel as though the way we deal with things nowadays is is wrong. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, I, I can't be out there for that. I, um, speaking on this, though, yeah, I definitely could not, like, be out there just for wait. hours upon hours and, and hours waiting. Like, this is a show coming on TV or something. And then y'all took garments and, off of y'all and go wipe go, his blood. And go dip it in his blood. Like, what, as a souvenir that you was there? Yes. That's That's weird. The same way, even back in the day when they used to hang people, lynch people, y'all would literally go out there and, and take pictures with the dead body and so like smile. I will never get that. That is weird. Like y'all are very, very, very. That's just like if somebody gets gunned down and y'all are all happy about young. it, y'all want to go out there and take a picture with the dead body. Be people what are the, really messed the? up in the head. Like this. Mm-mm. In the early 1900s, Eben Byers was a man who other people envied. He was born into a very wealthy family in New York City. He attended Yale University in Connecticut, which is a very prestigious Ivy League university, and he was devilishly handsome. After his college graduation, he didn't need a job because his family was so rich. And so instead, he focused his time on a passion of his, which was golfing. And in time, he became this world-class golfer, going so far as to win the 1906 U.S. Amateur Tournament, which is the biggest amateur golf tournament in the world that most of the winners go on to become professional golfers. And so Evan most likely would have followed that path and become a pro golfer had his father not just handed over the very successful metalworking business that he started that made his family wealthy in the first place. And so Eben stopped his golf career and became the chairman of this incredibly successful company. And so overnight, he basically went from being just rich to being uber rich, making more money than he could possibly spend. But Eben did attempt to spend his money. He pretty much immediately began buying up luxury properties all over the country. He bought horse racing stables in the United Kingdom and in America, and he bought an entire luxury box at Forbes Field, which is where the Pittsburgh Pirates professional baseball team used to play. And so in addition to owning all these incredible things, Eben also, through his role as chairman of this company, began connecting with and befriending very powerful and influential people like the founder and executives at the Coca-Cola company. And so all in all, Eben's life was really going quite well until 1927. That year, Eben was 47 years old, and he took some time off from gallivanting around the world and rubbing shoulders with famous people to go catch a football game at his alma mater at Yale University. So he hops on a train, he rides to Connecticut, he watches this game, and then afterwards, he gets back on the train to head back to Pittsburgh. And this is a very long ride. It's over 12 hours long. And so Eben naturally bought a first-class ticket, and so he was inside of a train car that had bunk beds for passengers to sleep on during the ride. And so Eben climbed into a top bunk and he fell asleep. A few hours later, after the train is well on its way to Pittsburgh, Eben, in his sleep, manages to roll to the side of the bed and actually falls out of his bed onto the ground. He lands hard on his left side, it wakes him up, and as he stands up, he thinks he's okay, but then he feels this shooting pain in his left arm. So he's moving his arm around, he's not really sure what's wrong with it, but he's hoping it's just some bruising, and so he decides to get back into his bunk and just go back to sleep. And so he 
manages to fall asleep despite the pain, and then when they roll into the station in Pittsburgh several hours later, he wakes up and right away he feels that pain in his left arm. And so after getting off the train and going back to his house and dropping off his luggage, he went right to his physical therapist's office to ask him if there was anything he could do to help with the pain in his arm. And so the physical therapist examines Evan's shoulder and determines that, you know, there's no structural damage to his arm, but obviously Evan is in pain. And so he says, look, you know, there's a new product that came online that's quite expensive, but since you're a man of means, maybe it's something you want to consider. It's called Radithor, and it's supposed to dull aches and pains, and it's supposed to give you this huge boost of energy. And so, you know, maybe you want to try that. And so Evan was really excited at the notion of taking this new health tonic and said, yeah, let's do it. And so his physical therapist wrote him a prescription for Radithor. Evan took the prescription and he went to the drugstore. He picked up a half ounce bottle of this liquid. He went back to his house and as prescribed, he drank a very small spoonful of this liquid. And right away, he felt this surge of energy. The pain in his arm started to fade. All the things this health tonic claimed to be able to do, it was doing. And so over the next couple of days, Evan been very diligently every day took the prescribed amount a very small spoonful of this radithor and every day he felt better and better and better not just the pain in his arm but overall he felt happier he felt fitter he felt alive and he was attributing all those feelings to this miracle tonic why you, why the doctor just didn't put in a sling you know what i'm saying like you fail that's another reason why I, I like with bum beds. I used to think about that all the time. Like when I was a kid, I never slept on slept on the top bunk because I know like I can roll over and fall off the top bunk and and hurt really hurt yourself. Because oh, yeah. actually, that happened to my cousin when he was in jail. He was on the top bunk. He fell, hit his head, mm -hmm. and had seizures, and kind of been messed up ever since because he rolled off the top yeah. top bunk. But and I always was like, bro, I, I, I can't do the top bunk. I'd rather be on the bottom bunk where it's safe. Somebody got to be on the top, man. Not me. <laughs> we, can, we can fight. But I guess his doctor didn't put it in a sling because, like he said, there was no structure damage. He just was in pain or whatever the case yeah, was. Yeah. I mean, I guess you could have probably... Like a pain pill. So. I guess pain, but I guess you maybe could have maybe wrapped it, I guess, to help with the... Pre like, you know, put a little, you know... Pressure. Pressure or something so that, you know, it can kind of like... Mm -hmm. I don't know, but I don't know why he... Or Didn't, he just went straight to this new medicine or whatever. That's a, it it's like, a medicine you that you, you that you know about, but you haven't technically because it's so new on the market. So you how haven't do you prescribed know it before, so to you don't know, know the, if it's something that'll the, work for him or because it's, good, it costs so size. much. So and he was like, "You got the money, so hey, yeah. it's be something good for you," you know. He began taking more and more of this tonic, well beyond what was prescribed, to the point where he was drinking three full bottles of Radithor every single day. And so for years he did this, and it was all going wow. great until his jaw fell off. Huh? Literally, in 1931, one day, his lower jaw just separated from his skull and went slack. And so the reason this happened was because Radithor was actually just radioactive water. In the early 1900s, what? the radioactive element, radium, was believed to have highly curative properties with no side effects. And so naturally, at the time, dozens of health products were created with wow. radium being their main ingredient. And Radithor was one of those products. It was literally just water and radium. And so after consuming over 1,400 bottles of Radithor over a three-year period, Eben's body was finally just starting to disintegrate from the inside out. After he had his jaw surgically removed, along with large portions of his upper jaw, the rest of his body also just began to crumble. And so by the end of 1931, when his story was making headlines all around the world about the dangers of Radithor, and really more specifically, the dangers of radium, Eben had become completely bedridden and his skull was now beginning to disintegrate. There were holes forming all over his skull that were exposing portions of his brain. And so by 1932, Eben was dead. Eben was buried in Pittsburgh and he was buried inside of a lead-lined coffin that was designed to absorb any of the radiation emitting from his bones. Wow. And then 30 years after he was buried, so in 1965, scientists actually exhumed his skeleton to see if it was still emitting radiation. And they determined it was still emitting the same levels of radiation as when he died. 
and they actually would ultimately figure out that radium, this radioactive element, has a half-life of 1600 years. So what that means is Eben's body will remain highly radioactive for centuries. Here is a picture of Eben with his jaw surgically removed. It was taken shortly before he passed away. I feel so sorry for him. I man. feel so sorry for him. And, and, and you know something? Like you, I'm going to say this. It's like you always say. Mm -hmm. People only take medicine because it's prescribed to you. So you're mm -hmm. thinking, you're taking something that the doctor feels as though is right for you. So mm -hmm. he wouldn't even took this medicine if, if the, the doctor, doctor never, never recommended it. You know, recommended it. My thing was, as me, say for instance, I was that doctor. Me being a doctor, I'm like, you have to like know these side effects, yeah. know what this actually is. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have continued to prescribe this medicine. Or for me, it would have just been, this is the first time you're you're getting mm -hmm. this medicine, and there's no refills on it. Yeah. There should be no refills. Yeah. Once you start to feel a little better, that's that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But that's so sad. Yeah, it is. There is still some debate about what exactly happened in this story that I'm about to share with you. And so for transparency, in this video, I am going to rely on the narrative that was presented in court by the defendant. And so with that in mind, here we go. On the afternoon of December 3rd, 2012, a freelance photographer working for the New York Post newspaper named Umar Abbasi was walking down the stairs of the 49th Street subway station in New York City. This very busy station is located only a few blocks away from the very famous Times Square. And so after Umar made his way down to this underground subway station, he walked over to one of the big automated kiosks that looks like an ATM and he purchased a subway ticket. And then with his ticket, he walked walked over to the turnstiles, he slid his ticket through the slot, pushed past the turnstiles, and was now standing out on the actual train platform. And from where Umar was standing, this platform basically was like a huge sidewalk that stretched all the way to his right a couple hundred feet and all the way to his left a couple hundred feet. And in front of this platform were the actual tracks down below, because the train, when it came out of the tunnel, it would actually come right up alongside this platform with almost no clearance between the platform and the train. As such, the leading edge of the platform, basically the lip of the train platform that's closest to the train tracks, has this big yellow line painted all across it to keep commuters from standing too close to the edge because if the train came through, they could actually get hit by the train. And so as Umar is standing on this platform and he's looking left and right, it's totally crowded with people and they're all kind of tucked back against the wall away from this yellow line. And so Umar decides he's going to turn right and wait at the right end of the platform just because he saw it down at the far end there appeared to be a gap in people and he figured he could stand right there and so umar begins navigating past all of these people on the right side of the platform and for the most part everyone he is passing either has their head buried in their phone or they're listening to music or both because the thing about riding trains especially trains in busy cities is nobody none of the commuters want to talk to anybody else they want to be completely left alone and so as umar is walking everyone was basically doing that but at at some point, he did pass two people that were engaged in a pretty heated conversation. Umar had no idea what they were arguing about or if they were even arguing at all. He didn't know who these people were, but he took mental note of the fact that two men were kind of bickering with each other. And so he walked past them, didn't give it much of a second thought, and he arrived at a gap in the gaggle of people waiting for the train. And there he just stood well back of the yellow line where he pulled out his camera and began clicking through the images he had taken earlier in the day at an earlier photo shoot. And so as he's clicking through these pictures, he starts to notice that those two men who had been bickering before are now straight up yelling at each other. They're screaming obscenities at each other. It's not clear who's fighting about what or who was the aggressor, but it's very obvious obvious that at this point they're fighting. And so Umar looked away from his camera and looked left down the platform towards these two guys. And so these two guys are about 100 to 125 feet away from him. And all the people that were standing in the vicinity of these two men are beginning to migrate away from them. They just don't want anything to do with them. Because the thing about being in subways, especially in cities like New York, is there's lots of people that go down into these train stations that are inebriated or mentally unstable. And so very strange and bad 
bad behavior is just kind of a normal thing and people tend to just kind of ignore it. And so that's what's happening. People are kind of walking away from these two fighting men doing their best to pretend it's not happening. And so Umar spent a couple more seconds staring down the platform at these two men, but eventually just shrugged and thought, you know what, whatever problems they have, they're not mine. And so Umar went back to his camera and continued to click through his pictures when all of a sudden he hears a scream coming from the left side of the platform. But it was not a scream that sounded like it came from either of these two men. And so Umar looked up from his camera and looked left down the platform and now he just sees chaos. It's people running away from these two men. People are running to get away from whatever is happening around them. And so Umar's thinking these men must have come to blows and they're now fighting actively physically with each other. But when finally the crowd kind of cleared for a second, he saw a woman pointing down at the train tracks right in front of where those two men had been standing. And so Umar looks at the woman and he follows her finger down onto the tracks and he sees there is now a man, one of the two men who had been fighting, laying face down on the train tracks. And then to Umar's horror, he looks up down the tunnel where the train would come out of and he sees the headlights of the train. It is now coming into the station. And so I wonder was he like not been conscious, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah, not where he can't get back up. Where he couldn't get up. And know? nobody could try to help him, you yeah. know. Like Dang, bro. starts running down the platform to try to get to this man to pull him out of the tracks. And as he's running, he pulls out his camera and he turns the flash on and he holds the shutter down and he aims it at the train conductor to hope the flashing of his camera will alert the train conductor to put on the emergency brake and stop the train before he hits this guy down on the tracks. And so as Umar is running, trying to signal this train conductor, the man down on the tracks tries to stand up and Umar sees He's really struggling to stand. And when he finally gets up, he turns and he grabs the edge of the platform and he tries to pull himself up and out of the tracks, but he doesn't have the strength or the coordination. And as Umar is getting closer and closer, but he's still too far away to help, he sees that this guy down on the tracks is not gonna be able to get out of there before the train hits him. And so Umar finally comes to a stop and he watches as this man down on the tracks lets go of the lip of this platform and just turns and faces the train like he knows what's about to happen. And then seconds later, the train, although it did try to stop, impacted this man and killed him instantly. The man's name was Kai Sakhan and he was 58 years old. When the police finally showed up, they arrested the other man who Han had been fighting with. He was a 30-year-old named Naeem Davis, and Davis would actually tell police that he had been fighting with Han, and he had pushed him onto the tracks, but it was in self-defense. However, that self-defense story didn't stop him from being charged with murder. While Davis sat in jail waiting for his trial, the media and the public at large had already come to the conclusion that Davis was guilty. And this was due in large part to a particular picture. As Umar was running down the platform, holding up his camera, holding the flash down, trying to flag the train conductor to get him to stop, Umar was also taking dozens and dozens of pictures. And those pictures were of Han right before he was struck by the train. And so after Umar ultimately discovered he had taken these pictures, he gave them to his employer, the New York Post newspaper, and the day after the incident, they ran on the front page a picture of Han right before he's about to be killed with the headline, Doomed. And so once the public saw this picture, nobody could believe that Davis was anything other than a cold-blooded killer for pushing this poor, innocent man onto the tracks. But as it would turn out, nearly five years later, when Davis did finally get his trial, he was acquitted of all charges because it turned out Han was very drunk and had picked a fight with Davis and Davis was filmed on more than one occasion on the platform trying to get Han to leave him alone. And so finally, after Han began making death threats and then grabbed Davis's shoulder, Davis turned around and pushed him and Han, being drunk, stumbled and fell backwards onto the tracks and then was ultimately killed. Here is the infamous photo of Han on the cover of the New York Post newspaper. So that's going to do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments. That's crazy. And, and, and to be honest, because he did pick the fight, mm -hmm. I, I understand why Davis didn't go to jail. He's, he's, a, he's, a, he's to be, of all charges. because at some, like at a point of it, he, even though he's guilty, 
but he's still not guilty because he was defending himself. Well, he's, he's not. What do you mean he's guilty but not guilty? Well, I'm saying like consciously he's guilty. Like as far as you still Like still, to, like he has to deal with the fact that this man lost his life, life but at the same of, time. But but he's yeah, I'm mean, I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, it yeah, just yeah. be like, you know, within myself like dang, you know, but this man he, gone but at the same time it's like I did all I could. I kept telling you yeah. know, leave me alone. You put your hands on and me first. Maybe if he wasn't drunk, he would have been able to, to get, get out. Up, to get up quicker and get, get out. Because yeah. for one, even him trying to lift himself out. That's why he, he didn't have strength because he, he was, was drunk. He was too drunk. And how he probably was heavily, heavily intoxicated. Who knows? Like who knows? Especially, you know, since they didn't I'm pretty sure they probably got his uh blood alcohol level out there somewhere, but yeah. one in this video. But yeah, but yeah, it that would be hard for somebody to, you know, to but at the same with, time. Yeah. You kind of have to think, like, when you put your... Like, what did you plan to do when you touch me or put your hand on my shoulder, you know, and not even aggressively that for, or whatever? Not even that. For five years, you have to sit in jail and everybody in the world thinks you're guilty. Yeah. The whole world has written you off because of a New York... And that's the reason why the media is such... Like, they are... The media is the worst thing to ever yeah. happen because... They only pay, especially in America. I don't know. I can't speak on any other country because I don't. I never visit another country. Mm -hmm. Haven't lived there, so I don't know yeah, about y'all yeah. media. But in American media, no matter where you get your media from, everybody only focuses on painting the a painting a negative narrative mm -hmm. instead of shedding more positivity. Right. Because the more even like music, movies, the reason why crime is set, one reason why crime instead of going up is because all we constantly keep feeding ourselves mm -hmm. is crime. Mm -hmm. Everywhere you turn around, crime, 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 crime. Yeah. We don't talk about anything else like tilt television. Everything is negative. Yeah. We yeah. we're never influenced by anything positive or putting like you gotta feed you gotta feed the world positivity if you want positivity out the world. But if you keep feeding negative, everybody's only going to be having a ne negative conversation of everything. Mm -hmm. And then the younger generation keeps only getting fueled with negative, negative, negative. Negative, yeah. And so, because think about it. If someone, if you grow up, someone always telling you, you're going to fail, you're going to fail, you're going to fail in life, you're going to fail, you're going to fail, you're going to yeah, fail. Yeah. <laughs> you're never going to see yourself achieving anything. You're going to always think, I'm, I'm going to fail. You're going to always I'm go in, you. you're going to yeah. always go into it. Like, why should I even try? I'm going to fail. Mm -hmm. But if you tell people, don't give up, don't give up, don't give up, don't give up. People going to go into something like, I, no matter what I do, I just can't give up on it. Yeah. Or no matter what I do, I can succeed. I just have to keep trying. Mm -hmm. But if you only keep telling, fueling people, you're going to you're gonna be, turn out to be a statistic. You're going to only turn out to be, that they, they weighs in people's head and mind. Yeah. So watch how y'all put things out there in the media and out in the light of the world. Cause you just can't say a man is 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 guilty without actually knowing the facts. Right. And without knowing the facts, the whole world looked at this man as, a as guilty. Being guilty. Just and, because and, that's... and not as a victim himself. Mm -hmm. All because another man passed. Mm -hmm. You can't always look at it like that, you know? Yeah. I don't know, man. Y'all let me know y'all opinions in the comment section. Y'all let us know what y'all feel, man. All these stories was like, wow. And I, I hate it for the guy with the, the, the radium. Yeah. I hate it for him. Yes, that was because that was I feel like that's just it could have been a, a different alternative for him to be able to I know you're in pain right now. But there's a, other options. Maybe not and back then. And it also makes me think also for the doctor, have you known anyone else to take this? You know, and what effects did it have? Or is it that new that you like, I know he got money. This is about to be the first one, you know, that I can like test and and, and know, you know, for future. Like, you know what I'm saying? And I so with that, do y'all do that a lot with people who got money? Run them as the test subjects because y'all know they can afford it. Who knows? You know, the, like the one of the stories like I had told you about. With, you know, everything that had been going on and some medicine was being prescribed to this person. Do you remember me telling you that? Well, I'll tell you afterwards since you can't remember. But, yeah. Go man. ahead. But with that being said, man, y'all spam us up. Let us know y'all thoughts and opinion. But as always, 
Y'all know how it go, mm-hmm. man. I'll be going with the name because we can do this. We are. We are. Go and get it. Ain't no time to kick it. Got a stack of flip for my folks. Dollar, 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 dollar. Please tell me you can hear me. Don't turn your back and don't neglect me. Just let me know if you need me. Dollar, 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 dollar.